Welcome to Defenders, the teaching class of Dr. William Lane Craig. Today, The Existence of God, Part 5. For more information and resources, go to reasonablefaith.org. Well, we're going to finish up today our discussion of Leibniz's cosmological argument. We've been talking about the question of why anything exists. And we saw that anything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or else in an external cause. We then argued that if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. Given then that the universe exists, it follows that the explanation of the universe is God. And we've looked at the principal objections that atheists or detractors of the argument might raise. Now, there's one last way that the atheist might try to escape this argument that I want to talk with you about today uh, by way of wrap-up. And this is very subtle, so I'm going to go slow so that you can get it. Um, What the atheist might say at this point is, well, there are no beings that exist necessarily. We've, We've argued that there has to be something that exists by a necessity of its own nature. And the atheist will say, no, no, that's not true. Nothing exists necessarily. Nevertheless, he might say, it is still necessary that something or other exist. There's nothing that exists necessarily, but it is necessary that something or other exist. So he'll agree with the theist that the existence of nothing is impossible. Something must exist. Uh, The existence of nothingness is simply impossible. But the conclusion he draws from this is not that therefore there is a necessary being, but that necessarily some contingent being or other exists. Now, this would be sort of like saying, necessarily, every physical object has a shape. But there is no particular shape that it's necessary for everything to have. Every physical object must have a shape, but there isn't any particular shape that is necessary for everything to have. So in the same way, the atheist can say, it's necessary that something or other exist, Some contingent being or other has to exist, but there isn't any particular thing that exists necessarily. So on this view, premise one turns out to be false. The universe just exists contingently and inexplicably. Something has to exist. It just happens to be our universe. It just exists inexplicably. Some universe must exist, and there's no explanation why this universe exists exists. Now, is there any question at this point about that objection? I know it's subtle, and so I want to pause at this point to ask, is there any comprehension type question? Yes. Does that then refute evolution? No. It doesn't have anything to do with and evolutionary the I theory. Was if, if, if it's necessary that something exists, but nothing exists necessarily, then they would suggest there's no hierarchy, no no consequence timeline that there was nothing there's no beginning to that in other words it's necessary that something exists yes so there therefore they would just not put any sort of relationship between things well now now that doesn't follow it seems to me that why can't the atheist say it's necessary that something exists and given that this universe does exist it just happens to evolve and life develops by chance and so forth, uh, it seems to me it just doesn't have any implications for biology or evolutionary theory. But I did like the way you summarized it. You summarized it better than I did. How, How did you put it? You said, it's necessary that something exists, but nothing exists, something, nothing exists necessarily or something like that, you said. Okay, well, it was very nicely put. It was very, very pithy. Uh, It's necessary that something exists, but there isn't anything that exists necessarily. It's necessary that something or other exists, but there isn't anything in particular that exists necessarily. Tom, did you? Okay, over here, Tom has a question. I noticed you didn't say that given that something exists or given that we exist, something necessarily exists. They're saying that even if we weren't here, 
something must exist. Is that right? right? <clears throat> That's correct. This is a very strange view. This is a radical view. Um, and it's not saying uh, conditionally, as you say, given that something exists, it's necessary. This is a view that it is logically impossible for there to be nothingness. And yet there isn't anything that exists necessarily. It's just necessary that something be there, something or other be there. And it happens to be us, but there's no explanation for that. I want to go to someone who hasn't asked a question already. Yes, Jonathan, right? Well, I suppose, uh, doesn't this somehow tie back into the cosmological argument in a way, too? They can't deny the premise in the Leibnizian cosmological argument if they deny the Kalam, right? Because well, a lot of that's the a good point. Say, now, yeah. let, let's review here. So he's using a lot of terminology that we need to clarify. Do you remember last time we talked about why should we think that our universe is not necessary? And one reason I said is because it's not eternal. It began to exist. That shows that the universe doesn't exist necessarily. Now, these folks would say that... That's right. This universe doesn't exist necessarily. So they'll agree with that. They'll agree that that there's nothing about this universe that makes it a necessary being. So they'll agree with that point that I was making. But they would say, nevertheless, it's necessary that some universe exist. Uh, And why this one rather than any other is just inexplicable. Think again of the analogy of the shape. It's necessary that any physical object have a shape but there isn't any particular shape that it's necessary that everything have. Uh, do the guidelines for whether something is a necessary or not, uh, does that have any uh, resemblance to you know, the debate on dynamic time uh, versus time as kind of a mere illusion? We've talked about that issue a little bit in this class, and we'll do so again. The difference between dynamic views of time or static views of time, I don't think that really plays into this again. Because whatever view of time you think about, the question is just why is there something, anything? And this view says it's logically necessary that there be something. It has to be something. But what it is is just inexplicable. Okay, let me take one more question, and then we'll look at a response to this objection. Yes. Isn't this position tantamount to saying we we can't refute your position, but we're just going to say because we don't want to believe it? This this is... uh, Yeah, I'm sympathetic with that response. Um, It is just sort of helping oneself to the logical necessity of something on an atheistic view. And that will actually be the second point that I'm going to make in a moment. Uh, It it is sort of ad hoc. That is, it's contrived to just assert this without any grounds for it. The theist has a reason why he thinks it's logically impossible that there be nothing. Namely, there's a necessary being. And therefore, it's impossible there be nothing. But on the atheist view, there's no explanation for why it's logically necessary that something exists. So it does seem contrived, I think. I'm sympathetic with that. Well, now let me give some response to this. And again, this response is subtle and... uh, Therefore, I'll take it slow. Alexander Proust is a brilliant young philosopher, uh, formerly at Georgetown University, um, but now recently at Baylor University. And Proust has pointed out that this view has an extremely implausible consequence. And the thrust of his argument here, of course, is that if something has an extremely implausible consequence, then the view that entails that is itself implausible. If you can show this view has a very implausible consequence, that suggests that the view itself is is very implausible. So what is this? Well, he says it's plausible that no conjunction of claims about the non-existence of various things entails that, say, uh, a unicorn exists. There's no conjunction of claims about the non-existence of various things that would plausibly entail that a unicorn exists. Think about it. How could the fact that certain other contingent things do not exist 
entail that a unicorn exists. Um, but on this atheistic view, the conjunction, there are no mountains, there are no people, there are no planets, there are no rocks, there are no books, there are no tables, etc., etc., until you list everything in the universe except for a unicorn, that conjunction entails that a unicorn must exist. Because if there has to be something, and this conjunction says none of these other things exist, uh, then it follows that the only thing left is a unicorn. And so a conjunction about the non-existence of all of these other things entails that a unicorn exists, which just seems absurd. Uh, and that suggests that this view is itself, I think, uh, absurd and implausible. All right, now, is there any question about Proust's response to this argument? Okay, uh, Jonathan again here. Could the atheist just suggest that um, would there something must exist necessarily, yet nothing, or something must exist necessarily, but nothing exists necessarily? No, let, let's rephrase or, sorry, that, sorry. because it, it necessarily Hold something must, must exist. exist. Yeah. But uh, nothing exists necessarily. Right. In that viewpoint, what if when you start listing those things, and let's say you did somehow manage to compile this massive list, what if they said, well, um, I guess what if they said, well, you can't list everything down. My, that viewpoint entails some sort of, you know, ignorance along with it on its part. I don't know. Well, I guess I would just say that becomes even more ad hoc than I can't see any reason to think yeah. that you couldn't give a list of all of the things that, don't exist. Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, no human being could do it, but I, I, we're talking here about a proposition right. that would be a conjunction, you know, uh, like not P and not Q and not R and not S, you know, out to infinity, uh, listing all of these things that don't exist. And if that conjunction is true, that entails that a unicorn exists if the unicorn is not one of the things that right. is said not to exist. And, of course, the unicorn here is just arbitrary. You could pick the tooth fairy or leprechauns or anything, Any sort and, of and, object, and you, yeah. you've got a conjunction of claims about things that do not exist, and that will entail that that thing exists. And that just seems crazy. Mm -hmm. Yes, Elizabeth. I'm sorry, this is probably a stupid question, but I just don't see why anyone would ever claim that nothing exists but a unicorn. Like, so what argument are we getting this from? Okay, the, the unicorn atheist? is chosen arbitrarily. As or, I said, we can pick right, any... Or anything. Why yeah. would you claim that nothing else exists except one thing? Well, we would do that in order to refute this argument. Uh, maybe I don't understand the question. Like, what, 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 what argument are we trying to refute? We're trying to refute the view that necessarily something exists mm -hmm. but there isn't anything that exists necessarily oh so we're saying that things do exist okay got it we're, we're, th this view says it's necessary that there be something but it, there isn't any particular thing that exists necessarily like the theist thinks right so if necessarily there has to be something and none of these other things exist then the only thing left over is this entity you've picked, uh, like a unicorn. And so a conjunction of claims about the non-existence of other things would entail that this particular entity exists, which seems really strange. I mean, how could the fact that tables and chairs and Cindy, you know, doesn't exist would entail that the tooth fairy exists? But, and yet that is the consequence of this view. So that suggests that this view is very, very implausible. Okay, let's, let's go to Cindy here since she's, her non-existence has already been <laughs> hypothesized and I want to give her a chance to come back. The atheist then would say, at least in what I've heard, all of our rhetoric and all of our defense is fine, but at least what I've heard is they acknowledge, or atheists acknowledge an explanation a rational and reasonable explanation of life, of origin, and so forth. It's just that we don't know what it is yet. Mm -hmm. And therefore, as time progresses and scientific thought progresses, more and more is revealed 
through that, such as, let's say, defining down to the origin of life. And, you know, everyone got excited in that community when certain energy was put into a certain chemical pool that then life evolved or became into being. So in, in their mind is... As long as there's no God involved, eventually we will be enlightened to answers for all of these rather philosophical and scientific questions. Is, is that Now, that response, Cindy, is very different from the response we're considering now. That person grants the truth of premise one, that everything that exists has an explanation. We just don't know what it is, but everything has an explanation. What you're describing is a person who denies premise two, that if the universe has an explanation of its existence, then it is God. And then you remember, I gave a twofold response to that. I pointed out that that is logically equivalent to the typical atheist claim, though not the one you're rehearsing, but it is equivalent to the typical atheist claim. And then secondly, I gave some reasons for thinking that premise two is plausible in and of itself. So I think that once the atheist starts down the road of saying everything has an explanation, he is really going to be backed into the corner on this argument that for something to explain why anything exists, it's going to have to be a necessary being that transcends time and space and and all the rest. Yeah, Ben? Um, When they say something must exist necessarily, do they give... Okay. I know this is this is it's so important to say this right, otherwise we get <laughs> right. mixed up. Okay, what nothing this is necessarily something exists, not that something exists necessarily. Okay, all right. Oh yeah, you're so, right. I said that. You're right. I said it so backwards from what I let, Let's let's see. Necessarily, <laughs> something okay exists, but there isn't anything that exists necessarily. Exactly right. Okay. When it says, is there, do they get the atheists, the people, proponents of this view, do they give any attributes to that something at all? Whether it be, can, do they call it a universe? For instance, they say a universe um, exists, but um, the way it exists is not Well, I think you could or use the word universe just in the sense of reality. Right. But there isn't anything specific here because... It's, it's contingent, and so it could be pellets that exist. It could be, I, I suppose, even abstract objects, maybe, as long as they think that they're contingent. Right, that's what I'm strange. saying. So there's no so, inherent attributes of it as far as it exists no, within time not, or particles or matter, anything like that. There's no inherent Right, it would, just be, it would just exist. Again, think of the shape. Uh, necessarily, everything has a shape. But it doesn't need to be triangular, cubical, circular, could be anything. Okay, um, I want to, David, Cheryl, like, let's go to someone who hasn't asked a question yet. Uh, I want to clarify Proust's uh, response a little okay. bit. Is, is the response that you can't have this conjunction of um, non-existence of things, or is it it's a conjunction of things that don't exist necessarily because I could imagine if it's just that things don't exist it's hard to see how this would be a good response because we know lots of things do exist we have chairs and tables and and atoms that that do exist so it's hard to see how that argument would follow well it's but, not the first alternative he does think that there, it's possible to have such a conjunction uh, theoretically, logically possible. No human could obviously enumerate it, but you could have a proposition that would be the conjunction of saying everything that doesn't exist. Now, you're quite right. That proposition won't be true in this world because there are things that exist. So that, he's not saying this proposition is true, but what he is saying is that the truth of such a proposition from that it would follow that unicorns exist on this atheist view. And that's just very implausible to think that a conjunction of claims about how other things don't exist would entail that a unicorn exists. That's the argument. So it's not meant to be a true proposition about this world. I guess it's just, I think I follow that, but it just seems like it's not such a big deal if no such proposition could be true. Yeah. 
on the other hand, I can see how maybe it does make sense if the argument is that P doesn't exist necessarily, Q doesn't exist necessarily, R doesn't exist necessarily, and if you run through you know, all possible things, none of them exist necessarily, and yet something has to exist necessarily. Yeah, no, well, yeah, see, he, he, that's not the argument. Okay, it, it is okay. more the former. It, and, and in a sense, you're right uh, that such a proposition could not, well, it, it, yes, it could be true, David, so long as it omits something. So long as it omits unicorns, that proposition could be true, right? That's the whole point. If, if you had something that enumerated everything, then that couldn't be true. But so long as it omits something, that proposition can be true and would entail that that other thing exists, which seems, as he says, very, very implausible, I think. I guess it, it could be true in, in principle, although... Well, and that's, that's what we're talking about. Okay. It's logically possible for that proposition to be true, and so you would have a conjunction of things... Or, conjunction of statements about other things that don't exist and that would entail that some arbitrarily chosen uh, entity exists which seems real odd um, yes over here remind me of your name Travis, Travis? okay so the, the whole argument seems kind of more philosophical panic anyway I don't care what you do just do something is that really the argument that we're that we're having here um, uh, I'm not sure what you, know, you mean. It's, well, in a sense, it's like, okay, something has to exist, but I don't care what it is. Right. Um, That's the atheist. Yeah, view. so looking at it from the point of view of saying, well, it's necessary that there exists something, yes. but that something doesn't necessarily have to exist. Well, right. if that something doesn't necessarily have to exist, what happens if I destroy that something? Does something else pop up into existence? <laughs> yes. So, so if I destroy a pen, a rabbit appears. If I destroy the rabbit, then a trash can appears. That, uh, well, that's an interesting point. I, I, yes, I, um, because it's logically necessary that something exists. But I don't care what it is. So that's, right. you know, that's where I get the panic idea. It's, it's, yeah, I don't care yeah, what well, exists. I, just I make something you. exist. And yet I have, th this view is taken by some atheists. For example, this view is expressed in a book by a philosopher named Bede Rundle on this question of why does anything at all exist. And I've heard other philosophers orally say this as well, that it's logically necessary that there be something, but there isn't any particular thing that has to exist. So this isn't just sort of airy-fairy. This, this is really out there, that this view is, is out there. But, again, remember... <laughs> The point of an argument is to raise the price tag of denying the conclusion. And here I think we see, you know, what sort of a price the atheist has to be willing to pay to avoid the force of this argument. Okay, I think we'll, do we, we can come back here to Jonathan now at this point since I don't see other hands. The thing that just came to me was, what if the atheist decides to pay that price tag, says, all right, I'll give you that argument, then... Is there anything left to say to that? I mean, well, I have one more point to make. I'll yes, I have one more point to make. But remember again, I think as I said the other day, Jonathan, in response to Cindy, you with a deductive argument, you can always avoid the conclusion by denying one of the premises. If you just are willing to bite the bullet, just deny one of the premises, and you can avoid the conclusion. So the question will be. Um, what intellectual price tag are you willing to pay? And, and we're not suggesting that we can force atheists to become theists. Yeah. I mean, that's obviously not true. I was saying, what if you could, what if we said something, what if an atheist said something along the lines of, uh, well, since we can't conceptualize any possible universe where all these things don't exist because we do know of a universe with matter, we do know of a universe with humans, with all of these different things that we do have, so in a universe devoid of all these things except unicorns, perhaps it is perfectly logical that a unicorn would exist. Well, it is logical. I mean, well, that's, that's what I was saying. So, you know, it's, it's, it has to be that way. Yeah. And if he's willing to pay that price, well, then he's welcome to it, but that is a pretty <laughs> high price to pay, I think. Okay. Okay, yes. And then, then uh, Kyle, after you. Uh, I was in a discussion with the atheist the other week, 
and uh, it, this is more Kalam oriented. It's more you know dealing with uh, necessary mm-hmm. beings and time. Uh, but I know you've defended the view in the past that uh, without creation, God is timeless, so then he's temporal yes. subsequent to creation. Yes. If uh, God, you know, if he's a necessary being, but he can be temporal at any point, then could the universe uh, also be necessary if it's temporal? Yes, I don't see why not. I, I don't think that necessary existence implies timeless existence. I, I just don't see any reason to think that because something exists necessarily, it has to be timeless. Okay. Thank you. Kyle? Okay, I have um, a hopefully an interesting observation on this. Whenever the atheist says that, uh, and this came to me whenever somebody else mentioned, well, if I destroyed the thing that necessarily exists, something else would necessarily exist. What I thought is that this seems to elevate logic to almost the role of an impersonal sort of god by something spontaneously popping out of existence to um, fit with this abstract, independently existing concept of logic. So it seems very strange to me that an atheist would take that step because, uh, for one thing, they would be acknowledging the existence of things that exist necessarily, like you've mentioned numbers in addition to God in the past being sort of like Yeah, and on this view, the the atheist isn't willing to do that. He wants to say there is nothing that exists necessarily. So you're pressing a question about the status of logic itself and its laws, and is there an explanation for the necessity of logic? And that raises a a whole different issue that we're not (laughs) pressing here, but I think is is a good question to raise. if the atheist ultimately has to abandon logic in order to save atheism, then I think the debate is over. Because then you can then say it's the, the theists, theists more logical. the logical, rational ones. Yeah. <laughs> so I think there was one more. Was there one more question? And then, okay, at the table behind you, Steve. And then I want to go on to my second point. Uh, the gentleman in the whitish gray shirt. I, I take it this primary discussion goes to original cause of God or not God and well, that there is something and that there is something there is defined in no thing that no thing and something are constructs uh, you're going to have to clarify that for and me could it be that God is more than something and nothing and that it actually exists in relationship or as relationship or expresses yeah. as relationship I mean, Heidegger talked about thesis and antithesis, being and non-being, right? Mm -hmm. And Wittgenstein says that there are logical absurdities. To say there is no unicorn is an absurdity because you've just created the construct, at least, of a unicorn when you say that. Well, understand that a unicorn here is a flesh-and-blood animal that has hair and uh, uh, spatial dimensions and weight. You're talking about the concept of a unicorn, not an actual unicorn. So there's... There's no absurdity in saying that this concept isn't instantiated. There isn't any real unicorn, even though there's a concept of it. But doesn't that hit to the very issue of the absurdity of humans trying to define God or not God? Well, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think that whatever God is, he's an, I don't think we'd want to say he's not something. We're using the word something here in a very generic sense to just mean an entity that exists. Um, well, of course, as Christians, we believe he's omniscient and omnipresent and omnipotent. But granted. if you take the premise that God is omnipresent, but the humans construct that there is this state of nothingness that's, uh, and that that's simply a human God construct, that God in reality exists as relationship with himself or as a Trinity yeah. God, that he speaks into existence, relationship. He speaks right, now, us into relationship. This argument doesn't try to prove the omnipresence of God, though it would show that God is a being which transcends time and space, and so in that sense is not spatially limited. And God can exist in relationship with himself. I think that there, God is relational in the Trinity, for example, and that wouldn't require the existence of a universe of physical beings or space. God could exist and be in relation with himself without any spatial 
reality at all without, I think, even any temporal reality. I don't think time and space exist necessarily. At least I've not seen any good reason to think that. Let me give a second response to this argument. On this view, there's nothing which would account for why there exist contingent beings in every possible world. There's no explanation for why there would be contingent beings in every possible world. In other words, I'm raising the question, why is it logically necessary that something exists? Since there's no necessary being, there's nothing that could cause contingent beings to exist in every possible world. And there's no explanation why every possible world includes contingent beings. There's no strict logical inconsistency in the concept of a world which is devoid of contingent beings. So what accounts for the fact that in every logically possible world, contingent beings exist? Given the infinity of broadly logically possible worlds, the odds that in all of them contingent beings would just happen to exist inexplicably is infinitesimal. If you think of all the logically possible worlds they are, the odds that in all of them contingent beings would just happen to exist is literally infinitesimal. And so the probability of the atheist hypothesis is effectively zero. There's zero probability that contingent beings would just happen to exist by chance in every possible world. And so it seems to me that this viewpoint uh, also fails. Uh, it, it has a probability of a effectively zero. Any question about that response to the argument? By contrast, I might say, on the theist view, there's a good reason why there are contingent beings. Uh, well, actually, there aren't contingent beings in every possible world on the theist view because there are views where, or there are worlds where just God alone exists. But the, on the theist view, there is a good explanation for why it's logically necessary that something exists. Namely, there's a necessary being. And that's why it's necessary that something exists, because there's a necessary being. But on the atheist view, there's just no explanation of why it's necessary that something exists. Yes? I, I may have missed this, but back to the original premise or the first point of the argument. Yes. Is it the atheist view that nothing has an external cause? Is that the foundation of atheism? No. <laughs> right. No. The, because th th this whole argument you're presenting today seems to be based on the premise that there can't be an external cause for anything. That's the, 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 oh, the, the non-necessary shape. The non -necessary. No, wait, no, wait. You're misunderstanding something here. Most things have external causes. I do. You know, I was conceived by my parents. Uh, our automobile has an external cause. It was manufactured in Ohio. Uh, this building has an external cause. So most of the things that we're familiar with have external causes. In fact, you remember some of you were pressing me the other day, give some examples of things that exist by a necessity of its own nature. And I was hard-pressed to do so apart from things like, say, mathematical objects or propositions, things like that. So most things have external causes, and everybody, atheist and theist alike, agrees with that. The question is, does everything that exists have an explanation of its existence? That's the, the issue in premise one. Any other question uh, about that final uh, response to this view? Yes, here's one over here. And Marion, maybe you could get out the argument maps for us. She's going to distribute these argument maps by way of summary, uh, and I'll go through those uh, uh, as we close. Yes, Claire. I hate to admit it, but I really didn't understand what you were trying to say there, but something about the atheist um, view that um, is, is totally Ill illogical because it just can't happen statistically. Um, oh, right. Well, let's imagine all of the different possible worlds there are, okay? Just think of all the different possible worlds there could be instead of this one. It's endless. I mean, it's infinite. Now, in every one of them, contingent beings exist. 
Contingent beings would be beings whose existence is not necessary. They don't exist by a necessity of their own nature. Now, if there is something that exists by a necessity of its own nature, it would hardly be surprising that in every possible world something exists. But that's not the atheist view on this objection. The atheist is saying, in all of these possible worlds, there just happens to exist something contingently. And there's no explanation for why that's the case. It just happens to be that way. Well, as I said, the odds of that happening by chance are just infinitesimal that there would be contingent beings in every single world. And yet that's what the atheist has to say. He has to bite the bullet and and, and affirm that, which, again, just seems implausible. Now, what Marion is distributing is an argument map that will summarize this argument. Given the truth of the three premises, the conclusion is that God is the explanation of the existence of the universe. Now, what sort of God concept do we get here? You had talked to this gentleman before about what kind of being are we concluding to. Well, this argument implies that God is an uncaused, unembodied mind who transcends the physical universe and even space and time themselves and who exists necessarily. I'll repeat that. The argument gives us a God in the sense of an uncaused, unembodied mind who transcends the physical universe and even space and time themselves and who exists necessarily. So this is a very rich concept of God. It it doesn't give you omniscience or omnipresence, but it does give you some of the central attributes of God. God. Certainly, it gives us enough attributes of this being that, uh, Marion, could I have one, please? It, it gives us enough of the attributes of this being to say that it's incompatible with any serious form of atheism. Now, for your review, here is a, an argument map of what we've been through. How does this work? Well, everything in blue is what the proponent of the argument says. And if the arrow goes down, that means that is a supporting argument for the argument above it. If it's in red, that's the atheistic response to the argument. And if the arrow goes up, that means that's that's resistance to the premise. So look at premise one. Everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. The atheist says, well, then God must have a cause to explain him. But then the theist says, no, God exists by a necessity of his own nature. And that terminates that line of discussion. Now, why think that premise one is true? Well, this is a self-evident principle. Think of the story of finding the ball in the woods that we told, and imagine the ball is then the size of the universe, That gives good grounds for thinking premise one is true. The atheist responds, the universe is an exception to this principle, to which the theist can then respond, making the universe an exception to the principle is arbitrary and commits the taxicab fallacy that we talked about. The atheist can then respond, it is not arbitrary, since it's impossible for the universe to have an explanation. But then the theist can respond, you're assuming that the universe is all there is, which begs the question in favor of atheism. You're reasoning in a circle, and that's the end of that line of discussion. So uh, you see how it goes, and this is uh, a nice way of looking at the whole debate, sort of looking at the whole discussion and wrapping up, summarizing what we've gone through. Does anybody have a final question about the argument map or about this argument for the existence of God? Anybody got a question about how the argument map works? Is that clear? Good. All right. Any final comment from anybody about anything? Yes, Cindy. Right. The concept of God that this argument gives us is a being who is an uncaused, unembodied mind who transcends the physical universe and even space and time themselves and who exists necessarily. All of those attributes emerged in the course of our discussion of this argument. 
Yes, um, Melissa. Go ahead. In your experience doing these debates, do you see that the actual atheist heart is being changed at all in going through these logic and or is it mostly people in the audience that you are trying to reach whose hearts potentially are soft to the Holy Spirit? It's the latter. I have no illusions about trying to convince the other man. Someone who's willing to get up in front of hundreds and even thousands of students and denounce God and denounce Christ isn't apt to change his mind in the course of a debate. But there are lots of students in the audiences who are really agonizing, really mm -hmm. searching, and who are open to argument. And, and something like this is designed to reach them. I want to add, too, what I thought Melissa might ask, but she, she didn't, and that is, do you get these sort of responses in the debates? And the answer is no. I mean, what I have done here is to give the atheist every benefit of the doubt. I've tried to think of every good objection the atheist might raise. They never raise most of these. They've never even thought about most of these things. I mean, you can't believe the superficiality of the interaction on some of these issues. So I'm really bending over backwards here to try to give the best objections that the atheist can raise and then how you might respond to these. Now, what I can't do, and I've, I've learned this through now the website, what I can't do is I can't anticipate every bad objection to these arguments. Uh, it, that is just impossible. Some arguments or objections are so flaky and so off the wall that you, you just can't possibly anticipate them. And there you're going to have to think for yourself. But at least I think these are the most important substantive responses that atheists have given to this sort of argument in professional journals and books uh, on the subject. And uh, I think that the argument survives those attacks intact and emerges from that acid bath uh, very, very strong and uh, as a good argument for belief in God. All right, next time we will turn to a new argument uh, that we haven't discussed yet, and we'll look at a different form of the cosmological argument, namely the so-called Kalam cosmological argument. The copyright for the content of this recording is held by Dr. William Lane Craig. For more, go to reasonablefaith.org.